I was a ceramics and painting major in college. After I decided I wasn't ever going to be a very good scientist, I was doing these very graphic, large structural, guttural, gestural pieces. It's hard for me to be monochromatic as a painter. It's the interactions of the color that creates both the chaos and tension, and at the same time creates the excitement and discovery process. Being confrontational is okay, but if you're confrontational in your artwork, it's a little easier than being confrontational with your neighbor. A lot of my pieces focus on the concept of us being one species, how all of us work together, how we all fit together, but how we maybe don't look the same. But the message is, this is us, and we can be together. We can wrap our arms around one another. We can create something that is the common goal. We need to honor that. And rather than the differences, we need to honor the similarities. If I can have a discussion with somebody and the Listen to what their point of view is, and they can listen to what I'm trying to say. Maybe you don't change anybody's mind, but maybe you can open it a little bit. Welcome to Angel City Culture Quest, where art, social justice, and the environment meet in Los Angeles. I am your host, Melina Paris, and I welcome you to this episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Angel City Culture Quest. Today, we are profiling artist Michael Stearns, Living in Color. Hello, Michael. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you, Melina? I'm great. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to share Michael's background and then a bit about his childhood, which I think informs so much of his work. Between 1964 and 1966, Michael served in Vietnam and Japan as a photographer while on active duty in the U.S. Navy. Following his time in the service, he was a partner in a ceramics studio called Opus 2, where he taught ceramics as well as drawing and painting. Michael was a fire captain and a paramedic with the Los Angeles County Fire Department from 1967 to 1988, and he was a consultant on the television show Emergency. Michael studied at California State University at Los Angeles. In 2002, Michael opened Gallery 33 in Long Beach. It exhibited artists such as Lori Lamont, Todd Brainard, Richard Lopez, Elizabeth Washburn, Adam Normandon, and Roderick Briggs. The gallery closed in 2008. In 2012, he moved his studio and gallery to San Pedro under the name Michael Stern Studio 347, and later to Michael Stern Studio at The Loft. As a sculptor, Michael works with cardboard and newspaper as a way to bring nature and urban society together. In Michael's artist statement, he explains how his work exemplifies his spirit. It reads in part, in my work, I dig deep into the origin of life and explore the universal questions. How did we arrive? And what is the force driving this existence? I strive also to invite the observer into this place of examination. As a painter, I work with organic shapes and mostly bold colors to intensify the imagery. In my sculptures, I incorporate natural materials along with urban components, creating communication out of discord. Michael grew up in eastern San Diego County, El Cajon, in the countryside, with three acres and lots of fruit trees. It was a time after World War II when he said nobody had money, but everybody was okay. People survived, and he didn't know anybody who was rich. He spent a lot of time outside where he found Indian ruins and arrowheads. He even found spaces near old oak trees where he could see actual holes in large rocks where First Nations people were grinding their corn into cornmeal. Michael said people were coming over from Mexico and his parents would put out food and water for the people who were walking across the border. In fact, he noted San Diego County features the largest number of tribes and reservations of any county in the United States. Growing up in that environment, he said everybody worked together and hung out. It was his upbringing. His folks were all red, and his father attended college. Education was important, but people were important. And as a result, a lot of his work deals with social statements. Now, Michael, you said that one of the things you've learned is you have to speak your piece, and you have to know when 
And being confrontational usually doesn't get you where you need to go. This leads me to how you make your statements. Can you talk about the mediums you use to state your piece? And can you describe one or two of those pieces? Yes, I think that in making social statements, being confrontational is okay. But I think that if you're confrontational in your artwork, is a little easier than being confrontational with your neighbor. I think that's partly what's going on right now, and it and it serves basically no useful purpose. We just all draw back behind our fences and go into the trenches. So what I'm normally using is natural materials. For a long time, I worked in clay, and one of the pieces that I did during the 60s was a piece I called the Bigot Ball. And basically, it was an egg-shaped ceramic piece that was very direct very confrontational at the time. It had words like racist and intolerant and anger and hate spiraling around the ball. And there was a very white hand coming out of the top of the ball holding a Confederate flag. So it was pretty confrontational. But I really didn't have to say much about it. I think sometimes when you deal with a piece, it allows the person to make a decision without necessarily saying anything. It did sell, by the way. I wish I knew where it was uh, (laughs) at this point in time, but I was like 25 years old when I made it. But in approaching confrontation and artwork, I think you have to speak from your heart. If you speak from your heart and from your soul and wear your heart on your sleeve a little bit, I don't think people are uncomfortable with that. And if they are, I think they understand it. If you can incite conversation by your artwork, if you can incite examinations of one's principles and where one is coming from. If you can have that conversation through your work, or if it incites discussion between you and the people who are viewing the objects, it allows us to perhaps focus on something which is not each other, but is an object we can discuss, such as the white arm and the Confederate flag. It leads itself to being less confrontational and less personal and more about the principle or about the theory. I think you can talk about that without necessarily being totally confrontational with the person who may be asking or discussing that issue. So for me, I can use almost any material. I've done pieces primarily out of cardboard of the human figure, using them to represent soldiers and uh, pieces that are about the horrors and the uncomfortableness of talking about war and of loss and what the losses of war cause to personal, to like mothers and fathers and those kinds of things. And those pieces, I tend to be represented very darkly, but I think it's a very dark subject and people get the message. It's not an anger-inducing kind of thing. It may introduce sadness. uh, It may introduce those kinds of things, but I don't think it's confrontation in, in that way. It's a good conversation to have. You had said that part of these pieces that you're discussing carried through to the fire department and that you had found yourself being sensitive to things that maybe you wouldn't have been sensitive to. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. And I think, and it probably isn't unique to the fire department. Obviously, it's, I think, any first responder, police department, fire department, Coast Guard, service people of all sizes, shapes, and descriptions. The opportunity is always there for you to run across dying and death and the destruction that comes with that, both physically and mentally. And yes, I mean, I have been in situations that weighed quite heavily on my head. And when I was in the fire department, they didn't have the support teams that they have today, which I think is really good. I'm sad that they didn't have it. It was more or less tough it out. We'll get over it. Uh, There's another run coming in another hour because where I worked was a very busy house. We were a very busy station and you were confronted with a lot of things. This before seatbelts, believe it or not. I mean, you you don't think about that, but the traffic accidents that we had were a lot more violent, a lot more graphic for want of a better term. And that just kind of weighs on you. It it, It just does. So I think that having been confronted with those kinds of things, we think that a lot of people become kind of used to it, become kind of hardened to it, but it isn't true. That's a good point. You did say there were good things too, though. I think you said that you delivered three babies. <laughs> yeah, so. that's true. That is true. Yeah. One of them was in a car on the way to the hospital. That was the first baby that's not supposed to happen that fast. But Mother Nature sometimes just kind of changes how things come out. 
And that just kind of makes your day, makes your week, makes your year. And I think you just realize that life is kind of all about balance. You know, I mean, it really is. So let's talk just a bit about the fire department. It was a long period in your life. You were with the LA County Fire Department for 25 years, and you were one of the original paramedics. Being one of the original paramedics, you said, to paraphrase Andy Warhol, you've gotten your 15 minutes of fame. This happened through the television show Emergency, an action-adventure medical drama. It debuted in 1972, and it ran till 1977. It also had six additional two-hour TV films following that. The series aired at a time when ambulance coverage in the United States was rapidly expanding and changing, and the role of a paramedic was emerging as a profession and is credited with popularizing the concepts of EMS and paramedics in American society, and even inspiring other states and municipalities to expand their service. Now, you said that you'd like to think that in some small way that what the squad that you were in did in the paramedic program and what the show Emergency did had pushed the fire department to become more professional, more involved in intellect. Can you describe how that happened? (laughs) Well, I can try. It was really interesting because the first 12 of us and one of the gentlemen dropped out because it wasn't where he saw himself in the fire service and they subsequently replaced him. But it was actually a pretty amazing time because you took 12 people who really didn't know each other that well, who in my case, I was a biology major for a while in college. And so I had a background kind of in understanding the human body as far as I knew all the bones, I knew the muscle groups. I had knowledge from that point of view, but a lot of the fire department types didn't. And this was all done at Harbor General, by the way, in Mm -hmm. the city of Carson. The opportunity that allowed us to develop was given to us by the supervisor, Kenny Hahn. This is one of his programs. And the county fire chief at the time, Richard Houts, felt that this program would help the fire department, like you say, become more professional. And we were the first responders. So in many cases, we were there before anybody else was there, before the ambulances, before anybody there. We were the people people called. So when we started doing this program, it was designed only to treat heart attacks. That was the the concept of it. And they immediately found out that we not only did we respond to just heart attacks, we responded to everything from delivering babies to traffic accidents to anything you can possibly imagine, as witnessed by all the TV shows about the fire departments today. But basically, all those stories were based on true incidents. The writers used to come and ride with the fire department people and basically listen to us talk around the table over that 24-hour shift period. But what I think led to this is it was around the Vietnam War, after the Vietnam War, and we had medicine changing unto itself. We had people coming out of the service, going into the fire department, police departments, various first responder groups who had been corpsmen or had been exposed to this or had worked around corpsmen. And you had physicians who were coming into emergency rooms who had worked on MASH units, who had worked with people who were not physicians and not registered nurses, not surgical nurses, but who had had specialized training in certain areas. So they were very giving of their information and their support. The people who probably struggled the hardest with expanding this service were the fire department itself at first. Fire departments can be very traditional, very slow to change what has worked in the past. And that probably still exists. Well, I know it still exists in Mm -hmm. in many smaller departments and large departments. Uh, We're constantly seeing things in the paper about that. It's a tough time. When you spend 24-hour shifts with people, sometimes it can be very tough. You know, it just is uh, until you find a crew that works well together. But the idea of totally changing the fire service into something that allowed this particular kind of service to be transformed had to overcome a lot of tradition. But once people saw how it worked, it spread like wildfire. It really did. And people suddenly realized, oh, my gosh. We are now providing a service to our constituents, our communities that we're here to serve. 
people really decided that they wanted this from their fire department. They wanted this from their ambulance service. They wanted this thing that they're seeing on TV. First, is it really true? You guys really do that. And the television show Emergency actually was based on what we really do. And one of the things I got to do as the captain of the paramedic program when I promoted myself into that position, because that was the first paramedic that happened to make captain, it allowed us to really start to grow the program. And it was amazing then and how fast it, it really grew. And I consider myself exceptionally fortunate to be able to look back at that and say, I helped this program help people. I think that's pretty lucky. It seems like a perfect storm of opportunity. Like you said, with the men coming back from Vietnam and being able to utilize their skills, being educated alongside other medical professionals and all helping each other. And then at the same time, the general public is being sort of educated as well through the TV show, modeled after the work that you guys did. It's actually pretty crazy when you think about it. <laughs> it actually, I know. I don't think there's ever been a situation really like is. that. Yeah. Yeah. So moving forward, we're going to talk about Opus 2 and the Navy. You also joined the air branch of the Navy and were stationed on an aircraft carrier in Long Beach. During Correct. that time, you opened a ceramic studio with a partner on the Belmont Pier. And it's also in the same place that is where today Chef Paul Buchanan's Primal Alchemy is. Is that is correct? <laughs> it was called Opus 2. And you had a lot going on in that space. Can you talk about the dynamics and what was happening at that time? This was the late 60s, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah it was. Uh, it was truly the 60s. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I could tell you more, but I don't really remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I have to. I have to. I have to be careful to protect the innocent. You know. Yeah. But no, it was. Actually, it was really, I, I was a ceramics and painting major in college after I decided I wasn't going to be a very good scientist. Uh, me and organic chemistry and math didn't do that well together. Mm -hmm. And I went back to being an art major, and it was wonderful. I started working with ceramics, and some of the guys like that I were, were contemporaries of me as far as me being the student and they being the artist that just knocked my socks off were well, guys like Ed Kineholtz. And some of the work he was doing uh, with social statements about abortion, about race, just uh, so many of these people who were using multimediums to tell a story. Some of the potters and the ceramicists of that time, Peter Vokos, with these huge, massive, very intense pieces that you wouldn't think would be being made out of clay. This is kind of the period of time that I was, you know, and to say nothing of all the abstract expressionists and the West Coast San Francisco School and the East Coast New York School of Painting, where they were using just gestural paintings and abstract expressionism and tons of color. It was really an exciting time, an intellectual time for, I think, the art world especially, and at the same time, very emotional. You were painting from your gut, so to speak, in many cases. So I think that this period of time was really exciting. And I was living in Long Beach at the time and was walking down by the pier and saw the small ceramic studio and went in and talked to the owner, a guy named Jim. And we started talking and I started talking about ceramics. And he was mostly the type of ceramicist who was very skilled in growing and made these wonderful large bowls and pots and teapots and cups and I was doing these very graphic kind of bigger ball kinds of mm -hmm. things and large structural hand-built kind of things. And so it was kind of, a, it was kind of neat. You had the, me who tended to be more of the guttural, gestural type of ceramicist, I guess you could say. And he was very, you know, he was throwing these beautifully graceful, large and sensitive little weed pots and things with beautiful glazes on them. So it kind of worked out and, you know, it was like, hey, let's see if we can just can work out and do this together and we'll split the costs. And it worked out really well for both of us. And Jim and I were together for quite a few years. He ended up moving back to Wisconsin, which was where he was from, and going back into the ceramics business back there. But it was really a good time. And I really enjoyed the opportunities to work and teach people. It was really, it was, uh, hell, it was the 60s, Marlena. <laughs> you know? Everything flowed. Everything flowed. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. I did. In the 60s, right before this, you had been studying art, as you mentioned. Yeah. Along with your Navy experience, you noted that artists have the ability or perhaps a gift of seeing things or hearing things that other people don't see or hear. This was when you were developing your artistic skills as well. And you were coming of age as the art world was changing towards abstract expressionism. And you said that you changed with it. So I'm wondering, was this change due in part to your art influences? And who are your biggest influences? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I started painting very early and drawing very early, as I think all kids do. We all start by scribbling and learning, just kind of learning how to hold a pencil or a Crayola or, yeah. you know, a whatever, piece of chalk, uh, drawing on the sidewalk, playing in the sand with our finger. A couple of Christmases ago, I taught my granddaughter how to draw on, on a foggy window, much to the chagrin of her mom, who's <laughs> going to have to clean them later. But I think that the first things we draw, we try to reproduce what we see. We do flowers. We do those kinds of things. I remember as a kid, I drew pictures of ships and airplanes and flowers and you know, just all fish. I like to fish. So I did pictures of fish and people fishing in lakes where people would be fishing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I knew there was, you know, it looked like a lake where there'd be somebody fishing there if, if, if there was something. So I think we all kind of start that way. We all kind of start trying to reproduce what we see. How the transition occurs, I think, is sometimes really interesting. And maybe it's the fact that cameras got better. Uh, reproduction methods got better. Uh, artists weren't being used to illustrate stories, per se. There wasn't a need for them, perhaps, to do a Sistine Chapel to tell the stories about Christianity or about the Bible or whatever they were using as a source of material for whatever maybe spiritual need, because that seemed to drive a lot of the art. A lot of the art was driven by spiritual needs and wants, which is interesting. But I think that I've always been attracted to color. If people see my artwork, it's hard for me to be monochromatic as a painter. It's hard for me to work in black and white. It's the interactions of the color that creates both the chaos and tension, and at the same time creates kind of the excitement and discovery process of the little parts and fun parts of each and every piece that I hope I do well. But I think that uh, this period of seeing guys like Rauschenberg and Rothko and just these guys, the list just goes on and on. Motherwell and mm -hmm. Clifford and powerful painters. And so many of these people use this intense color and working from basically the visceral side of our head, of our body, of our thought processes. Rather than reproduction, it was more creation is the way I guess I would describe it. We were making external on pieces of canvas or pieces of sculpture, things that we would ordinarily be internalizing from the point of view of dramatizing maybe the human figure or replicating the human figure or some structure such as a camera might see it or as we might imagine an idealized figure that so many of the artwork existed or telling a story about a particular place or period of time with a painting. I think that that transition started probably with the Impressionists where they started talking about light and the distortion of light and how that might work. And they're still doing light work today, but it sure looks a whole lot different than it did for the Impressionists. So I think that when it started crossing over, there are probably a thousand reasons why it happened. But I think basically it was being exposed internationally. I think the wars that occurred in the early part of the 20th century allowed people to move for whatever the reason back and forth into places that they might have never seen before in their life or would have seen during the course of their lifetime. Yeah, the uh, GI Bill you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the GI Bill created a lot of people to go to Mexico, for one. Talk about use of color. I grew up in San Diego, and I still think there's a great deal of influence from the Mexican palette that mm -hmm. I work from, because I spent a lot of time down there, still do. And I think that not as much as I used to, but I think that a lot of that use of color, that excitement that comes from working with color, probably is partly influenced by the Latin influence of Mexico and Latin America, Central America, has entered into my process. 
I think that that's when art really kind of changed to where we're going now. I couldn't tell you. I mean, it's becoming so technical in many cases. So much use of the computer, so much use of that kind of virtual art is Mm -hmm. uh, quite honestly beyond my scope and skill. I'll be very honest about that. It's a whole different medium. But your colors are just vibrant and they exude life. So we're going to have a link to his website, but people can see exactly what you're referring to right now when you're talking about color. It's beautiful. So after Opus 2, you took a 20-year break from professional art. You were raising a family, but still your creative juices were manifesting in different ways, you said, like in landscaping, and you enjoyed cooking, and you still drew, especially with your kids. (laughs) Um, And then later, you made a transition to being a sales manager for a title insurance company, which you said was a natural fit because you were in management in the fire department. And this is when you were about 46. Right. Fast forward to your 60th birthday when you had been talking about getting back into the arts. This actually turned into a very successful time for you. Can you tell us what happened when your wife initiated your birthday events? <laughs> I happen to be looking at her sitting me across the room right now, but, but uh, <laughs> having lunch. But, and she's smiling and nodding and feeling very happy about it. Well, we'd been talking about it, and I'd take her to museums, and we'd see art shows. And you know, I just kept saying, God, you know, I really miss it. I really miss it. I, just, I miss the creations. Putting your hands in clay. There's something, you know, it's like planting. When you go out and you plant things, or you dig in your garden, or you prune trees, or whatever it is, life, it feels different. I think it causes you internal changes. I really, really, really do. I think that being outside kind of works that way. And making something out of clay, or just putting your hands in it and feeling how making something out of basically nothing, mud. I mean, you are working with mud, you know, really. I mean, you really think about it. You're taking water and dirt and mixing it together and you make something and then you put it in an oven at some degree of heat and it turns into something hard and it can be a useful vessel. It could be a piece of art that sits on the wall. It could be tile that you walk on. There's a sense of satisfaction, I think, that craftspeople get from doing that kind of thing, which is probably the same feeling that a scientist or an engineer gets from creating something or solving a particular intellectual problem. There's a glow that exists within us that people feel viscerally that causes us to feel better or gives us a sense of calmness or a sense of euphoria. In some cases, I think entertainers must feel that when they Mm -hmm. sing or act. But I think that the idea of moving paint, just taking a brush and dipping it in a great yellow (laughs) and just (laughs) watching that or a good bright blue and watching that come off the brush onto the canvas, it's just there's just something magical about it. I mean, somebody had to make that color. And in the old days, it was us, the artists. So we had to grind it and all of that kind of stuff. But just watching that happen or watching that pencil or a piece of charcoal and watching that dust fall off the pastel that you're dragging across the piece of paper or the canvas or hammering something from a sculptor point of view and watching this grow, watching you release what's inside that block of marble Mm. or wood or whatever and releasing that, you can't deny that. It doesn't go away as much as you want it. Maybe sometimes you think it's going to go away. So what she did was she said, okay, big shot. I hear you talking (laughs) like I've been talking just now. Why don't we do something about that? Why don't I kind of help you along And for your 60th birthday, I'm going to ask people, it wasn't a surprise, I'm going to ask people to bring you either paintbrushes or acrylic paints because she knew what I painted in. And that's going to be your 60th birthday party. And people showed up, 60, that's a big birthday, a lot of people. I had a lot of paintbrushes, a lot of tubes of paint, and a lot of gift certificates. (laughs) So then I'm walking the streets and we're out for our walk and we see a realtor friends of ours and I say, hey, you got any space? Because I know you have a small, you know, you have a lot of commercial stuff. You got any small spaces that I can rent? And he goes, no, but I do have this little studio apartment and this complex that somebody just moved out from. What do you want it for? I said, I was an art major in college. I want to get back to it. And he goes, okay, I'll rent it to you really cheap. He said, let me fix it up and I'll rent it to you for like, it was like 
125 a month or something like that. And I said, don't fix it up. I'm going to try to paint in there. And that's how it started. And I thought, okay, if I go there, if I can do this for a year, I gave myself a year. If you can go there and paint for a year, then we can get started. And lo and behold, things started happening. It was terrible to begin with. I just, you know, you almost forget which end of a brush to use. But it came back pretty quickly. And my love of color just kind of kept driving me. And so I did this for a year. And then I found another space. And I was this was like a studio space. And it was like, hey. And then I found another space. And then I found another space. And it just kept growing and growing. And that was 23 years ago. You were off and running. Yeah. She was a good salesperson and she knew when to close. (laughs) And obviously obviously she did. She was the hand in the back saying, hey, let's do this. Jump in. Yeah, that's great. Let's go there. Yeah, let's go there. Not that I'm an artist or not that, you know, not that I understand exactly what you're talking about, but it's important to you. So let me help you get a little subtle shove on the road. You know, it's like watching me get back on the bicycle. That's wonderful. Hello, everybody. If you're just tuning in today, we're profiling artist Michael Stearns, Living in Color. Thank you for listening. Hi, folks. This is your host, Melina Paris. Angel City Culture Quest is growing. We're barely into our third year now, and there's so much more quest-worthy inspiration to bring you. Art, books, film, coverage of local events, and more. We've gotten a new QR code, so you can capture episodes on the go, because I know you're busy. We've been creating artistic flyers unique to each episode and new Angel City Culture Quest stickers. And there's more to come. As you know, there are costs to keep this podcast going. So if you're able, join me in this quest with your support. Think of it as a cultural tip jar to share any amount that you're comfortable with. I would deeply appreciate your support. Even a few dollars a month will contribute to my ability to continue bringing you the great work of these artists, activists, and others, and the cultural content that you want to hear about. I would be honored to have your support. To donate, please go to my Patreon link at patreon.com forward slash Angel City Culture Quest. There, you can also see all of our past episodes. Thank you. It was a successful time for you, and you came to San Pedro about 2012 or 2013. Mm -hmm. At that point, you had been on the board of directors at the Museum of Latin American Art. That was from 2001 to 2008, and also on the board at University Art Museum at Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, I uh, resigned two years ago, I think. They were redoing the museum. They changed directors, and I believe that a new director obviously wants his own people that he could work with. I'm not a young person, and I think sometimes, you know, you want to work with maybe more forward-thinking people, people who are maybe more familiar with the more contemporary kinds of art that's going on now. But I just wanted to give him the opportunity to name his own people, and I thought it was a good time. And I also wanted more time to, you know, to do my own artwork, quite frankly. So it worked out well, and I enjoyed being there. I enjoyed what we did while we were there. I enjoyed MOLA. I got in Leadership Long Beach, which is kind of a group that people who are interested in maybe being involved in cities and and city government or boards or commissions and things like that, giving back to the community. It's a great organization. And you were also on the Arts Council for Long Beach. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd done that and I thought, okay, I have an opportunity here to be on some boards. I should take it and I should try to get back. And financially, I was able to do that. So it worked out well. You said you believe in tithing. And it's true. We got to give back. So, yeah, we more power to, to you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do have to give back. Yes, yes, we do. I think it's kind of our process, you know, and I think art's giving back. You may not be the most talented person or the best singer or you know, the best artist. But if you can share what you have. That's important. Yeah. I think it's important. I mean, 
you're doing it. You know, you don't have to do this podcast, but you do. Yeah. But you do, and you do it well. Thank you. Uh, And thank you. And thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I feel fortunate to be here, but I think this is what some of us do. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm very fortunate you are here. So thank you. (laughs) Now, when you came over to San Pedro and during this time when you were also doing your work on these boards, you met your assistant, Andrea Serna. Correct. And she spoke to me and said, when you first met in 2008, this was after the financial crash, you were doing art philanthropy, which is a good way to describe what we just discussed. She said, you have a very big following in Long Beach and collectors who you still do commissions for. Correct. During the time, you needed help running the business of your art And then you opened that studio on 7th Street in San Pedro and started doing gallery shows. Andrea coordinated the shows for the gallery, the artists, and the exhibitions, and it really resulted in a great response, she said. True. She said about you, more than anything, Michael has works that connect with people. He loves color, and he has a lot of collectors that just love his palette. His work is not overtly messaging. He does have a subtle message in there all the time, which mostly has to do with the connections of humanity and shared DNA, the breaking down of racial barriers. She also said it's been the best working relationship that she's had her entire life and that you're a very accepting person and very patient. That's a wonderful statement, by the way. (laughs) Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Now, you had an exhibition last summer called The Colors of Life, which looked at human DNA. About it, you had said, For years, I have been interested in the human genome and genetic variations. And recently, science has discovered that neither race nor ethnicity is detectable in the human genome. The completion of the Human Genome Project is one of the most important scientific developments in history. Michael, can you discuss your works that have focused on our shared human DNA? Yeah, I think that a lot of my work, especially my sculptural pieces, focus on different ways of kind of getting to the same point, I guess. I think that goes back to my science. I took a class called human genetics in college as a science major, and that's what we talked about. I mean, we talked about DNA and those kinds of things. And at the time I was taking those classes, they really hadn't gotten to the point to where they could really map the human genome. They just weren't there yet. They kind of knew it was dinucleic acid, but they didn't really know what it did. So science has been just really amazing in the last 50 years from where we were to where we are today. And to me, the concept of us being basically one species, so to speak, because there were others. There were the Neanderthals. They were us, but they were not. So there's been some changes that we've kind of come out of. A lot of my sculptural pieces use color to represent basically the colors of us that were considered white. You know, obviously, there's black, there's brown, there's red, there's yellow, to paint it in its most basic form. I use those colors representing, for want of a better term, tribes of people that work together. So I'm using these to kind of represent how all of us work together together how we all fit together, but how we maybe don't look the same, Mm -hmm. but we're all working together to get to the same point, to create the same sculpture, to fit into the sculpture, to create something which hopefully is, if I've accomplished my purpose, either sends the message or looks well, or maybe subtly has some sort of message in there that people aren't quite sure what the message is, but the message is, this is us. This is who we are, and we can be together. We can be next to one another. We can wrap our arms around one another. We can join in to create something that is part of the common goal or common good. Look, this is a piece of sculpture which on the wall people go, oh, that's really cool. I really like that. I like the way that works. Well, what it might be is a piece called the universal genome, which is all the colors that exist. And I might even throw in the colors of the medicine wheel from the Hopi Navajo tribe or the way that maybe another tribe uses the color wheel a little differently. 
presents it a little differently. Because I think these basic colors, they tie us together. Spiritually, I think color ties us together more than we really understand sometimes. I think it's just so visceral how color ties us all together, how music ties us together. Um, yeah. You can hear a song in Spanish or English or Chinese. It may not be correct on the Chinese. I don't think they use the same notes as we do. Yeah, uh, and I think you're right about that. There's different tones in different parts of the world. But I can sit and listen to Mexican music songs in Spanish, and it's as beautiful maybe even more beautiful because I don't understand it. what yeah. I'm hearing is the words and feeling the emotion. But every society has drums. Mm -hmm. Why do they have drums? Because they want to make noise. <laughs> Not necessarily unpleasant noise, kind of a beautiful noise for want of a better term. If we go to the caves around the world and we look at the art that was done by the primitive man, they use the same symbol, and the caves could be half a world apart, and you know that these people didn't communicate with one another that we're aware of in mm -hmm. a way that we communicate. There's things that we do that we're not even conscious of that tie us together, and sometimes I like to work from that point of view, is that our gut feelings are the same, our heartbreaks are the same, our love feelings are the same. We cry, we sing, we beat on drums, we dance. We work together to create projects, get things done. I think that if I have a message, that's it. We need to kind of honor that. And rather than the differences, we need to honor the similarities. Well said. So, Michael, where do you find inspiration for creativity and your positivity, especially now as we're dealing with a largely uncertain future? Well, it's always an uncertain future. <laughs> right, know? that's true. <laughs> Especially at right. my age. Uh, no, in all seriousness, this has been a tough three or four years, you know, and I think I'm fortunate in that I tend to see things from a glass half full from what are our similarities rather than our differences. I think my parents helped raise me that way. You know, my parents weren't perfect people by any stretch of the imagination. You know, a lot of parents aren't, but they taught me about the goodness of people's hearts, I think, and that we're all trying to do the best job we can, I guess. I think the hard part in today's world is to try to not listen to the shouting, because I think that shouting is based in fear. I know there's a lot of things that people are probably afraid of, real and imagined. And if we engage from that level, I think it's really hard to get your message across if that's what you're trying to do. You know, I think singing, dancing, I think it allows us to perhaps manifest some of those feelings. I was thinking about the war periods. I'm old enough to remember World War II. I wasn't that old, but old enough mm. to remember. And I remember as a kid doing a lot of drawing about the war, guns and tanks and ship singing and basically playing battleship, but actually doing the drawings myself. Based on what I was seeing, probably on newsreels, what I heard my folks talk about, and my friends who had family in the service. And so an awful lot of what I was doing, those drawings I was doing as a five-year-old and a six-year-old and a four-year-old were done about dropping bombs. And I think that had a deeper effect on me than I probably realized until I started thinking about it not too long ago. When somebody asked me about finding some artwork that I'd done a long time ago versus something I'd done just, you know, within a couple of years. And I started going through some old stuff and I found these drawings and, and it was like, holy smokes. You know, you just kind of had gotten lost in, over the course of time and years. So I think that it just kind of brings home sometimes we really don't know how it's going to affect us necessarily in the future. I think most of us know that what we do is part of that. I think about video games today, and I've had this discussion with myself a thousand times. Is the U.S. Army paying for all these war games that well, I don't even know what they call because I don't play them and I don't see them, but it's like life was real enough. I don't need to play war games. That's an interesting thought. How much of that kind of frustration or that, that yeah, I'm going to get this guy or whatever, how does that feed back into our daily lives? And 
that's really kind of an unsettling thought for me. Mm-hmm. And it should be an unsettling thought for, I think, a lot of us. I mean, obviously, I'm not talking about censorship, but people are talking about wokeness. And it's like, yeah, maybe we should wake up to guns. Maybe we should wake up to AK-47s and AR-15s. We're going to talk about causing damage to our society. These are the kinds of things, to me, and I'm doing a show at a gallery called Gridley Art Space in November dealing with these kinds of issues. It's not oh, a plug, it just kind of popped up. No, that's um, great. But I think these are things we need to really think about where our lives are going. And it's really sad, I think, to hear the frustration and the anger in so many people's voices in the world today. So does my artwork represent this? Yeah, it kind of does. And am I frustrated right now? Yeah, I really kind of am. I think the hardest part right now is it's hard to be optimistic in this time. Yes, there's so much going on. It really is hard to be optimistic. And there are periods of time when I'm not so optimistic. My friends have always said, you're always trying to look at the good side of things. You don't get sucked up into that negative side of things very often. But this is hard. This is a hard time. I mean, it just is politically, health-wise. It's a hard time. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Sometimes I wonder if how guys like, what's his name who invented Facebook feels, how does he go to sleep at night? You know? No, I mean, really. I think a lot of us have read the story about how he started and how it came to be. And he's obviously a very bright fellow. But sometimes I think what really disturbs us all is, you know, we just don't know where it's going. And we just don't know how people are going to take advantage of it. And I think what was kind of simplistic in its starting is now turned into a multi-headed monster. And we hear people talk about artificial intelligence, and maybe we should start backing off of AI, because what's the truth and what isn't? And where is it going? Yes, exactly. And where's it going? Yeah, it's very difficult to navigate these things without a proper understanding of them. And yeah, That's largely and I'm, we're you know, I'm not a techie guy by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. Anybody who knows me knows. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that there's a point when we just kind of have to hope that either we catch up to the systems in our heads or that it just doesn't run away from us all at some time. And maybe, you know, you're talking about somebody who's in his 80s talking versus some 14-year-old kid who's, you know, or one of my grandkids who's a computer engineer who's like, gee, Grandpa, I don't know what you're concerned about. I, you know, I got this <laughs> under, but I got this, don't worry about it. And maybe that's the truth. But life is pretty sweet, and it just hasn't been sweet in a while. And it'd be nice. I'm not looking for pie in the sky, and I don't mind the fact that there's conflict in how we do things, perhaps. But it just doesn't have to be so mean, I guess. That's the thing that upsets me, I think, probably the most, is you know, if we just took it back a step and we just listened a little more and didn't engage, wasn't formulating the argument to defend our position, but rather listened to perhaps the thought process. If somebody looks at some of my pieces that tend to be about these kinds of things, perhaps, if I can have a discussion with somebody about something and maybe listen to what their point of view is, and they can listen to what I'm trying to say, maybe you don't change anybody's mind, but maybe you can just kind of open it. We can open our mind a little bit. I hate the term woke. It seems so artificial and it's kind of cutesy. And it's a word that's designed, I think, the way it's being used nowadays, too assign somebody to a position. And that's not what it was about. So I think that if we could figure out a way just to kind of talk about things. Like you said, listening, the connection comes through when you hear another person's thought process, which is what you were talking about before. And I really like your analogy of the cave paintings using the same symbols in entirely different parts of the world. If you think about that, that's that communication and that connection that you were talking about in your artist statement. Well, we all have spiritual leanings. It's part of our DNA for whatever (laughs) reason. And we all have spiritual leanings, whether or not it's the one that goes to church on Friday or Sunday or Wednesday, or we use a bell or we use a drum or we use a horn or a guitar. We all have these spiritual feelings, and they're all trying to do the same thing to us personally. And we just need to listen to it a little more. 
Yeah, and you've mentioned that you had been to all 50 states. So you've seen how people in all 50 states have lived their lives. And when you see how people live their lives, you understand them better. I think so. Yeah. It gives you an opportunity to, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, it does. And I think we are all products of our environment. I guess that's the old biologist talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is, we are. And if we understand that what happens in Montana maybe can't happen in Long Beach. And what happens in Mississippi can't happen in Miami. Just the way we live is so controlled in many cases by our environment and just how life has been. And we expect everybody to understand it's our point of view. And that's, it's some, you just can't sometimes. You just can't. But that doesn't mean they're bad people or, or their ideas are wrong. It just means it just doesn't mean that work where we are and vice versa. Exactly. So, yeah, Some people but, can harvest gardens and other people can't harvest gardens, but they can do other things that right, nourish right. themselves. Right. Yeah. And I have this, I call it idealistic, I guess. Well, I am a kid of the 60s. You know? I mean, I, <laughs> so, so some of the stuff is like, didn't we do this? Weren't we here once before and we thought we had it fixed? Well, obviously we didn't. So you know, whatever the young kids want to say, well, you had a chance, but you didn't do it before. They're right. We did. And we didn't. And however the reason that is, I'll take you. Know, start again. Say, start again. Yeah, you just get up and do it again. Fall down seven times, stand up eight. That's kind of how we got to approach this. That's what life is about in many ways. That's been great to talk to you, Michael. You mentioned the show coming up in November. Can you talk a little bit more about what's coming up next for you? Well, I am at the loft. We do have a gallery. I've got my studio and my gallery space there. That's obviously every first Thursday of every month. There's some shows that I'm trying to be in in a couple of places. I've got some stuff out right now. But I think that the show in November is probably going to be my focus right now, working on completing that particular series that I started and just kind of got off the track. It just didn't feel right to continue working in that thing. I had to do some things that I felt I needed to do about the pandemic and mm. some issues that that raised within us. And so I did those pieces. But I think as an artist, we need to be observers and we need to react to our environment around us and we need to make statements about it. I truly believe that. I think we're historians in our own way. I think there are writers who write about it. There are singers who sing about it. I think you can see it in the artwork. And I think that's part of what we are. However, we choose to manifest that. We need to talk about today and we need to say something about today. I think a lot of us in the visual arts tend to kind of write these artist statements that are kind of vague and kind of foggy in what we say. And I think that we really sometimes just have to really say, say what, we what, mean. I'm, what I'm trying to do is change your mind about something or to speak to something I know is not right viscerally. And I know that's hard to do, or maybe that's not where we're supposed to be going. But to me, I think that's where we're supposed to be going. I think that we have a certain obligation because we see things different. Musicians hear things that, to me, a musician is that they might say the same about me. But the idea of taking a limited number of notes, the same limited number of notes that most everybody else has to use, and to create and to hear those notes in your head and then write them down on paper. And then if you're a lyricist, create words to go with the notes. That is so abstract to me. I mean, it's just so abstract to me. It's wonderful. It's such a gift. And they might feel the same way about the way I mix my paints and put them on the canvas. Because sometimes it just takes over. When I really know a painting is working is when I know I'm not thinking about what I'm doing, as strange as that sounds. It's just flowing. It it's just, just flowing. comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's maybe why all of us pick up the brush or the pencil and sit at the potter's wheel or sit at a piano is when that happens, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It doesn't happen every time. Right. But nothing happens every time. <laughs> but it happens and you're getting it down and it's evolving right in front of you as you're doing it. So yeah. that's wonderful. Michael, this has been a wonderful discussion. I really am so happy that you have joined me today. Thank you for taking part in this episode. And thank you for sharing all your history and your thought processes with us. Can you tell us where to find you? 
Well, I'm at Michael Stern Studios. Physically, I'm at 401 East Mesa Street in San Pedro. Uh, (laughs) But the easiest way to reach me is michaelsternstudio at gmail.com. That's great. Well, thank you, Michael Stearns, for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity. Blessings. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.